Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Julie Chan Show, where passion meets purpose. So excited to be with these amazing, powerful women this morning. We've got Quinny Holland here, who is an intuitive matchmaker. Yes, you will want to know all about her practice. Elizabeth Yang, who is an attorney, does all kinds of incredible things, including just out with her fifth book. And we've got Leslie M here, author of Swagger and has a coaching business and travels all over the world, helping people find their passion and purpose. So let's get to it, ladies. So good to be with you. We're going to start this morning with Quinny. Quinny. Hi, Julie. Thank you so much for having me here today. And I just want to share about what I do. And I am a life coach and dating coach and an intuitive matchmaker. And guess what? I love what I do. <laughs> what does it mean? What does it mean to be an intuitive matchmaker? You know, that's an excellent question. And what I share with my clients and, and anyone who's interested in knowing more about what I do is connecting to our inner knowing, right, your intuition, or our, um, what I call our light, you know, so it's a beautiful way for us to remember who we are. So how intuitive matchmaking works is I work with clients who are a bit challenged in calling in their one, right, or if they're in a relationship, they're wondering if this is the right person for them, yes. right? And yes. so what I do is I walk them through a process of clarity from within. So anything we want to know about ourselves, we have to connect from the inside, not from the outside. It's inside out is what I call it. So you meet people and you guide them through hearing their own voice. Yes, exactly. And, and how do you do that? Do you do that through meditation, journaling, asking lots of questions? What does the process look like? The process looks like this. I use what I call my own insights, my own experience, because I was challenged when I was da uh, dating, right? And so I use those. I was able to connect my dots and create a program for my clients, right? And so from that process, I also incorporate uh, spiritual psychology tools and skills to enhance my coaching. And so the first step I ask them is, this is what I start with, how clear are you about what you want in life? And what I call my top 10 list, the 10 qualities that they would like to call in their one, or it doesn't matter if you're in a relationship or not, because you still need to go through this process of what do you truly want in life, right? If you call in that mate, right? And so, um, we're talking about the qualities. So the qualities you're seeking from another person, you also must carry that. Does that make sense? Like, for example, if you're looking for someone who's generous, right? Yeah, um, be generous. You have to be generous in, in order to, it, it's what I call a vibrational match, a synchronicity almost. And in a beautiful way, when you are generous, you are attracting generosity. It's, it's just part of life. And lacking that understanding is going to be a challenge and you create your own obstacle. And I've seen this on a consistent basis. Now, you came from being a tax attorney. You were the studious girl who went into studying hard and becoming a tax attorney. You left all that to become an intuitive matchmaker. What did your parents think of that? Oh, that's an excellent question, dear. <laughs> when I first told my dad that I had transitioned my career to dating coaching and being a, you know, I love being an intuitive matchmaker. Um, he asked me, what, what is that? He's like, what is that? And I'm like, well, I, I didn't really go in and explain to him every single detail. I just let him know that I'm really happy doing what I love. And he's like, okay, great. And that was that. Wow, that's incredible that he yeah. was so supportive. It's, it's like acceptance, right? I mean, it's, it's a beautiful validation that as long as I'm happy doing what I'm doing, all is well, you know? So it doesn't matter what label or what title I carry, 
It's what I'm happy. I'm happy. And you went from one thing to a totally different thing. So how was it that you found that passion? How did you know that was inside you? Oh my God. Okay, so I'm gonna share a brief story. Um, I was having lunch with a friend and my friend's sister was challenged with her dating life. And so when I went home, uh, when I was driving home on the 101 freeway, it came so clearly to me, this is strong knowing that, oh my God, I'm going to be coaching. I'm going to be uh, helping people who are interested in finding their soulmate, you know? And that was very clear for me. And so I said, you know what? Okay, fine. I'll just follow this strong intuition and knowing, and I'll just do it. And then from then on, just clients show up and I didn't have to do any kind of marketing or anything. It's just, it was a natural progression of what I love. It's just being of service. And was it hard for you to leave that steady attorney job to go and do something totally different, unknown, didn't know where you were going to get the clients? No, I will admit this. When that knowing came and the way my life has already blossomed, I met my husband, I have been married for about, um, I think our second year, um, three years into our marriage, I was financially very comfortable. And so there wasn't stress in that process. And part of my teaching is learning how to relax and meditate and connect from within. So everything, it's just like the universe is, I feel like the universe got my back. Does that make sense? Yes. But it's not your back. There's so much faith in what you want to do. You just move forward. There are no doubts. You just step into it. It is. It was outside of my comfort zone, but I, I was in such faith with it that I just kind of, it was a leap of faith. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say. Well, you have this strong intuition. So your knowing guided you. And where for many of us, we hear a voice but then we pull back and we're not sure. Is that a real voice? Can we count on that voice? Or should we stay in the steady job? Oh, that is an excellent point, dear. Because I remember what, um, when, when I was so busy, I don't listen to that inner intuition, right? I ignore it too. And I do understand. And a lot of people are in that position. And I get it. And so my whole coaching, coaching service it's not just about dating it's about how to live a fulfilled life right you have to listen to that inner voice it is the i call our gps right if you're driving a car and your lights are not on you're going to be lost right mm -hmm. so if you have that guidance that that inner guidance you um, you're you're going to navigate excellently you're not going to be lost you can be a little confused, but it, there, there's clarity from within. And so everything, the fog will be shifted, you know? And I just love the fact that we can listen to that inner guidance. Incredible. Thank you so much, Quinny. There is just so much more you could share with us. But for anyone watching auspiciousconnections.com, they can join your workshops. They can be guided by you. You are incredible. Love what you're doing. We'll Thank you, my dear. We'll Bye -bye. You in a minute. Elizabeth Yang, so good to be with you. You are this amazing attorney. You have your big law firm. You manage so many people. You have your fifth book just came out. And you are a mother of two kids. You juggle it all. You travel every weekend. You post all these amazing pictures on Facebook constantly. You're so genuine, so engaged always. How do you do it all? Uh, thank you, Julie. You are too kind. Well, you know, everyone's got 24 hours in a day. And so it, it all comes down to what we set our intentions on and what we're aiming to create day by day. I, I have a planner that I actually write in every single day. And I write down every single thing that I'm setting my intention to do. And it's amazing, pencil to paper or pen to paper, it really manifests it as a reality. And do you do this the night before? Do you write down everything you're gonna do the next day or do you do it in the morning? What is your process? 
I write in it throughout the day. So like as I check emails, right? If someone's like, oh, let me, um, uh, I want to meet with you for lunch on this day, I write it in. You know, if I, I have a reminder like, okay, let me uh, complete the first chapter of my book by Friday, I write it in. So throughout the day, as events come and invitations come, I update my planner. And you are on, always on it and you're just checking the boxes as you complete things. Yes. And for goals, I have a first page in the planner that I have like all my goals for the year. And then I have like um, separate pages for each month with my goals for the month. So I'm like always setting different goals, um, depending on whether they're short term or long term or, you know, whenever I want them to be manifested. You used to work for a law firm and then you left and you started your own and you manage about 20 attorneys now. How did you go from, you know, working for somebody to then creating your own practice and your thriving practice? <laughs> so when I was working for a large law firm, um, the hours were crazy. They, even though they paid well, they treated us like slaves. You know, we, we had to bill over 2000 billable hours every year. And I had my first child, my daughter. So during that first year when she was born, I had a nanny take care of her full time. I was out the door before she woke up. By the time I got home, it was like after dinner, she was asleep. And so I was like, if this continues, my daughter is going to grow up thinking that my nanny is her mom. <laughs> She's not going to get any quality time with me. So I was like, something's got to change. And that's when I decided, you know what, I'm going to create my own law practice. I'm going to charge more affordable rates rather than like the thousand dollars billable rate. I was billing, being billed out at by the large law firm. And so I came out on my own, took a risk. And I'm so happy that I did because now, you know, I'm able to create whatever schedule I want. I can go pick up my kids, drop them off at school, take them to tennis lessons, you know, do whatever I want because I set my own schedule. I'm in charge of my business. Um, I have 10 attorneys and 10 paralegals. So a team of 20 total, but um, we're growing because we specialize in family law, that's one of our biggest uh, specialties. Mm -hmm. And in the during the pandemic, the number of divorces has been on the rise. Mm -hmm. You know, so many couples don't know how to cope during the quarantine and they're like stuck together with no way out, no space. And so like the easiest resort is to file for divorce. So we've been just so busy recently. As a family law attorney, you come to your practice I think in a very different way. I think there are many attorneys in general, whether it's family law or any kind of law, who maybe have an attitude of this fighter mentality. You show up very differently. Where does that come from? Well, we specialize in mediation, right? So we're the law and mediation offices of Elizabeth Yang. And I really emphasize mediation because I went through my own divorce back. Um, I filed in 2010. My marriage was only a year and a half. And our divorce lasted four years because our attorneys kept telling us to fight each other. You know, and we already had fire between us. So they just added oil on top of on top of the already burning fire. So it was super easy to make our flames, you know, huge. And so we fought for four years. We between the two of us, we spent half a million dollars on our attorney fees and um, we were miserable. The children were miserable. My whole bedroom was filled with my own divorce paperwork. You know, not my client's paperwork, but my own divorce paperwork. And then finally at the end, after four years, we still ended up settling our case. Um, I realized like I didn't want to have a fight with the father of my children forever because I'm tied to him at the hip. You know, we're going to be grandparents together. We're going to be attending our kids weddings together. So I decided to become friends with him and settled the case um, and mediated. So now when clients come to me, I share my story with them and I tell them, you can either choose to fight the same battle I did, repeat my footsteps because you're not the first person going through a divorce. So many other people have gone through it. Or you can learn from my lessons and jump to the mediation step a lot sooner and save yourself a lot of attorney fees. You know, I tell them straight up, you can save up for your own kids' college tuition or pay for my kids' college tuition. <laughs> the choice is yours. And I definitely prefer you guys mediate because 
it's so much more rewarding to me when I see the impact it's making in families and in, in kids' lives. Incredible. You're so powerful in everything that you do and you do it with such great intention. How in the world did you find time to write five books also? <laughs> well, my my latest book, um, which you talked about earlier, Social Marriage, um, I really wanted to get this message out to the audience. So that was my motivation to spend that time writing my the story. And so the concept of social marriage is it's something that my husband and I practice. Um, you know, the concept of legal marriage came all the way from the Middle Ages, you know, so far, so long ago. And it came because like women back then didn't have equality with men and women had to get married to a man in order to take on his last name and in order to own property through her husband. Nowadays, you know, the times have changed so much, like women and men are equal. We can own property on our own. And yeah. so um, with the divorce rate being at over 60%, you know, over 65% in Los Angeles, there's so much more uh, benefits to social marriage rather than legal marriage. Uh, one thing is that when you get uh, legally married, all of your debts and your husband's debts are combined. And so creditors can actually come after both of you guys now rather than one person. And a lot of people don't realize that. So there's like a lot of like consequences um, and terms that you're agreeing to when you sign that legal marriage license that, right. that people don't realize. It's literally like signing a legal agreement without reading the terms, right? There's like community property. There's the spousal support that's calculated using the distal master. There's like all these terms that people have no idea they're getting themselves into right. until you know one day divorce comes around the door and then they need to like learn everything at that time. So social marriage is being in a loving, committed relationship, choosing to be with that person without requiring a legal document, without requiring government approval to, to evidence that commitment. Like Quinny was saying earlier, it's from the inside out, right? So that love and that commitment is something we choose on a moment by moment basis. Right. You don't need a, a license to prove it. Right. And you don't feel forced or trapped because of the legality of it potentially later. Absolutely. Yeah. And then people also can't use it as a fighting tool. You know, so many couples, they fight and they're like, I'm going to file for divorce. And sometimes they don't even mean it, but because it's there, they use it as, as ammunition to, to like, you know, fight the other person. When you're in a social marriage, you either choose to stay together, you choose to break up. There's no ammunition. You don't need to use that tool. Was, was becoming an attorney and helping people in this way always a passion for you? Um, helping people definitely was. Being an attorney was like never in my calling growing up. My undergrad was actually electrical engineering and computer science. So I was like total nerd, uh, great at math and science, went into engineering, designed radars for the B-2 bombers for five years until I shifted into law. So everything happens for a reason. And um you know, Leslie, who's going to be talking next, she'll, she'll talk about how sometimes like you just follow and go with the flow. And, yeah. you know, when the when the right energy is there, it feels right. And you just go along with it and know it's for a greater good. Incredible. Love all that you do for your family, for the world, for everyone around you. You are an incredible being. Thank you so much. We'll be back with you in a minute. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Leslie. Hey, Julie, Hello. how you doing? Congratulations on your book and your first debut book, Swagger. I love it. Swagger. Why Swagger? Why did you decide on this name? Well, I spent the last 13 years traveling the world, working with Fortune 100 organizations, and and I've had the, the pleasure of being in, in front of rooms filled with these incredibly ambitious and and passionate humans what i discovered about all of them regardless of the country i was in the culture the the company or the level of the individual whether they were c-level or or new entrants what i discovered was that at the core most people just did not believe that 
who they were authentically was good enough to bring them success and that they could not show the world who they were and still achieve their dreams. And when I realized that it completely broke my heart because this is the, this is the worst thing I can imagine for anyone is to walk around feeling like who you are is really not good enough. And I, shifted the the way that I was training people. I mean, I, I was sort of doing that anyway, but I went way, way deeper into that and started to focus on that. How do I help people to unleash that part of them that they're hiding away from the world that is really the most powerful, the most differentiated, the most electric, the most connective thing about them and prove to them that it'll actually be good for them and not bad. And I identified that quality as swagger, but not that old kind of show off, peacocky, in your face, arrogant kind of swagger. Uh-uh, hell no girl, that is not my kind of swagger. What I'm talking about is my definition and that's the ability to manifest who you really are and hold on to it in the face of all of that psychological crap that's gonna come for it, regardless of the situation or environment. So it means you have one face, one truth, one heart, and you bring it to every party you go to, no matter who you're with, no matter how high the stakes are, or no matter how challenged you are. And it's become my my complete passion and purpose. Yes. Well, and you didn't start out this way. You didn't know <laughs> at the beginning out of college that this was going to be your your work and that you were going to be a coach and teach people to find their own authenticity. So oh, where God, did you no. start? Where did you start and how did you come to this? Well, actually, my my path is so weird. I was I started out as a singer. I I was uh, I was back in the day, back in the I don't want, I don't want to say how long ago it's going to date me, but I was back in the day and I was obsessed with British music. I was living in Montreal, but I was a, the punk movement, the new wave movement, and I started a band when I was 16 in Montreal and we did pretty well. And my it was my dream to go and live in the UK and pursue my dreams. So when I was 19, that's what I did. I packed it up and I moved to the UK. I didn't know a soul, took my stuff, and I lived in the UK for 17 years. But what happened was I I worked as a singer for, for many, many years, but my music partner was um, the head of a, a, a head of acquisitions at a film company. So we spent so much time together and I was always a big reader writer. Um, he would give me scripts and say, have a read and tell me what you think of this. Do you think this would, you know, this is good and whatever. And so I would give him feedback. And then he asked me if I would do some, um, some script analysis, meaning writing reports for studio execs and so on. I said, sure, why not? That went pretty well. And then he said, do you want to do some script editing and script doctoring? I said, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And then because I was working so heavily in story and structure, I figured, hey, listen, I know a lot about this. I'm going to start writing TV proposals and try and pitch them to production companies and see if I could, you know, sell a TV show. And on one of these occasions, I had my TV concept and I was in this big production company in the UK and I'm doing the dog and pony. I'm selling it hard, you know, cause you gotta go big or go home. And the guy who owned the production company said to me, oh, you know what? You should be on camera. And I said, oh, clearly you're a genius. Of course I should be on camera or whatever. And they gave me a talk show. And so that was my first stint on TV. And I didn't like this show cause they wanted me to be uh, Jerry Springer and I wanted to be white Oprah. That was my dream. I was like so obsessed with Oprah. I was like, I'm gonna be white Oprah. Oprah. So and, we'll do right? white Asian Oprah. Yeah, and I was like, no, okay, apparently not. No, they want me to Jerry Springer, it's not gonna work. Um, but it it opened up a TV career for me. So I did that for, for a few years in the UK. Um, and then I decided to move back to Canada. I'd been away for 17 years and I wanted to be closer to my to my family. So I moved back and I really had no saleable skills. I had a lot of transferable skills and you got to know the difference in this life. You know, I had a lot, a long list of transferable skills, but really nothing on paper in terms of resume. So I took a risk. I figured that my skills would work really well in advertising found the biggest advertising agency in Canada and literally talked my way in. And nice. they gave me a job as an intermediate copywriter. Within oh, about 11 or 12 months, I was creative director. 
Incredible. Because that's transferable skills for you. You know, it doesn't, like I learned the business and I had all those skills in place from all the things that I'd done prior to that. Um, but uh, in that role, I, like many people in the corporate environment, discovered that I was having such a hard time finding the support for my people that they needed that mm -hmm. I, I personally was so busy putting out fires and doing client business and, and the politics and all of the, the, the challenges. And my people were suffering. They were suffering with their confidence. They were suffering with their competence. Mm -hmm. They didn't, they didn't, you know, have the support for their developing skills that they needed. And I could not find any good training for them. I really couldn't. I looked and I could not find, um, people didn't understand the ad business and stuff. So I came home and said to my husband one day, I feel like I'm using my superpowers for evil instead of good. I think I'm going to quit my job and start a training company. And he said, are you, are you crazy? You hate training and you're untrainable. I said, right? <laughs> Who better to start a training company than someone like me? Because if I can create experiences for me, that I would have liked, I'd probably be onto something. Anywho, that was 13 years ago, and we've traveled and trained all over the world since. So it's been a it's been a crazy, crazy ride and a crazy path. But oh, I'd like to point out that I was uniquely unqualified for everything that I did in my life. But what I had was self-belief. That's what I had. Right. Always had this deep confidence. And it sounds like you you walked into every door that opened. And even if it just opened a smidge, you pushed it all the way open. Oh, yeah. Oh, forward. yeah. I'm someone who recognizes when a door has a crack in it. You know, I can see that little lean forward. And I want to point out that what I, I didn't have confidence, because confidence is very different than self belief. I think you right? were born with confidence. I well, think I was born with self belief. I see here's the thing about about confidence that people, they really don't understand. Everyone wants it, right? They want it. It's like it's like the the nirvana of being according to, to most people. And they'll do anything to get it. They'll fake it to get it. Mm -hmm. They'll pretend they'll do anything to create the illusion of confidence. But the, the truth is you can only gain true legitimate confidence mm -hmm. through competence. Only when you've, when you've done something over and over and over again, enough times to convince your very resistant brain that, yeah, I, I pretty much got this. Like you could throw me in a bunch of situations and I'd be able to handle myself, you know, baseline, I'd be able to handle myself. Only then can you experience that thing called confidence. And the problem with the fake it till you make it thing that everybody's telling you to do, which by the right. way, don't do it, bad idea. But everyone's telling you to do but this. Everyone else can feel that. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And, and the thing is that the fact that you're running around telling everybody that, oh, I got it. I know what I'm doing. I'm all over it. It completely limits your ability to gain the competence that you need because now you can never go ask for help. Right. Cause you'd have to confess that you're not so perfect and you're not so put together and that maybe there are some gaps in your knowledge. And frankly, who are you kidding? Because we all start from this place of knowing. Yes. Everybody has to go through their place. You've got to own where you are in your journey. Okay. And other people have to remember that uh, uh, that was you too five minutes ago. So, you know, gentle there, buddy, right? Yeah. That yeah. it's not, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not born into this world having this huge level of competence in everything that we're aspiring to do. That's what the journey of life is for. So you, got, you cannot fake it. You got to just feel it till you find it. Do not fake it till you make it. I love it. Feel it till you find it. And clearly you are living a passionate life. You're passionate about your coaching and all the ways you bring people to their calling and finding their competence and be having the confidence to walk through all of those doors. So incredible. Love your book, Swagger. Just great. We're going to bring everyone else back on and it was so fabulous to be with all of you lovely, lovely ladies, and you are all lighting up the world and following your passion and just bringing your light to everything that you do to help others. And I, I just love all of what you do and how you're helping the world, really yourselves right? Like when we show up doing the thing that we are good at, the thing, our God-given talent, we help everyone around us, especially ourselves. And it's 
really wonderful to be with you all. Leslie, Quinny, Elizabeth, thank you, thank you, thank you for a wonderful morning. Take care. Thank you, everyone, for watching today.